Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this uh, inaugural live stream. Uh, we are very excited to start bringing some science back to you, uh, and uh, be sure to keep a lookout on our, all of our Facebook pages for even more uh, ways you can participate in Science City at Home. But thanks for joining us uh, this Friday evening. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium at Union Station. Uh, and today, I figured I would take you on a little tour of our local night skies. Uh, so, um, we are going to switch on over to a special bit of software I have here. This piece of software is called Stellarium. A really great uh, bit of software that you can uh, get at home. And um, I, you'll see, we'll uh, be able to have sort of our own planetarium uh, right uh, in the comfort of our homes. So um, while we are letting folks join us, since we are just starting out the tour here, I'll go ahead and give us a little tour of what we're looking at. You might have noticed a lovely Kansas City skyline uh, is right in front of us with Union Station there in the distance towards the north. And can anybody guess where we are looking at Union Station from? Well, if we and around here we can see that we are sitting on the steps of the Liberty Memorial, at the World War I Museum and Memorial. There it is towards the south and actually we can see something in our southern skies up towards the southwest. We've got the moon shining brightly up there. We'll talk about the moon uh, during our tour and then of course the sun setting in the southwest. This is the current sky as it is in Kansas City right now. Um, at about 6 p.m. And this will be kind of our backdrop for our star tour. All right, so let's go ahead and get things started. So this is our daytime sky and our star tour has begun already because our daytime star is shining Towards the west, we can see that it's going to be setting here in just an hour or so. Uh, we do have to wait until a little bit later after sunset for our night sky to be visible. Um, so we can see towards the west here. I'm going to start fast forwarding time a little bit. And we are going to wait for that sun to set. And here we go. There are different levels of twilight. There's a Sort of an astronomical twilight where the stars will come out and then there's uh, the uh, sort of civic twilight that astronomers like to call it when um, it's kind of dark but you can't see many stars all right stars are coming out here now this is a simulated view of our night sky if you're standing right here in kansas city unless there was a power outage you probably wouldn't see this uh, this many stars this is thanks to light pollution mostly uh, Man-made light sources like buildings, street lights, and car headlights send all sorts of extra light up into the sky, uh, which bounces off our atmosphere and it makes the sky kind of glow when you're near town. But the great thing about having a virtual planetarium at our fingertips is that we can see uh, the stars without that light pollution. So we're going to continue on until that twilight is mostly gone. And we're going to go ahead and pause things a little bit before 9 o'clock. And that's going to be a great time for our star tour. We'll hit things at 8.45 p.m. tonight. And this is our evening sky that you'll see here in Kansas City. And we've got viewers from around the world. Uh, so I do want to mention that uh, this is the night sky you can see in a lot of different places. Um, the night sky will change and be different based on how far north you are. So Kansas City is located at about 40 degrees north latitude. Um, and so this is going to be the view of the night sky if you're uh, at that uh sort of distance away from the equator wherever you are on Earth. So that's kind of cool to think that, you know, we share our night sky with different places. If you were to travel north, you would get a different view of the night sky, um, and the North Star would be in a different place. We'll talk about the North Star in just a minute. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to kind of uh, start by talking about constellations in general. When we're in the planetarium, normally I, uh, I do this now because our eyes are adjusting to the darkness, but you're probably on your computers or your phone, so your eyes don't really need to adjust to the dark, but I'll talk about it anyway because it's a good introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Um, so one thing you can see in our night sky are stars and constellations. A constellation is a group or pattern of stars connecting the dots to form a shape. 
Uh, constellations are more than just pretty patterns, though. They've been around for thousands of years, and they've been important tools for people throughout history. They've helped farmers to plant and harvest crops on time before we had reliable calendars. They allowed explorers to navigate safely at night time before compasses and GPS and Siri. And of course, many constellations represented different gods and goddesses that ancient people worshipped. Now today, there are officially 88 constellations. These were all picked back in 1930 by an organization called the International Astronomical Union. That's the same group of people who recently demoted Pluto, by the way, so we can thank them for that one. And I'm going to make a quick adjustment here to make these a little bit easier. Again, this is our first virtual star tour, so forgive us. We are still kind of figuring out uh, the uh, best way to do this process. And I want to do this. Uh, let's see. Ah, this is what I want. So, yeah, let's make those lines a bit brighter so we can see those star patterns more easily. There we go. Like I said, 88 uh, constellations in total. 42 of these are animals, 29 are inanimate objects, and the other 17 are people or characters from mythology. And we'll be visiting a few of these during this 20-minute star tour. Let's go ahead and bring our regular stars back. Now, we're going to start facing north because there are a couple famous patterns in the northern sky that I like to start out with because a lot of people already know them. If you face towards the northeast this time of the year, I'm going to kind of zoom things out a little bit so we can see it more clearly. You'll see a pair of patterns that kind of look like big spoons. You can see this one very bright over here. Here's the handle of the spoon and the scoop. Then we've got another smaller, little dimmer spoon right here with its scoop. For the dippers, the big dipper and the little dipper. Now the big and little dipper are... Uh, uh, not official constellations, they're what we call asterisms, which are sort of unofficial star patterns. But they're part of two uh, official constellations called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which means the big and little bear. We can see these bears in our night sky as well. So we're going to look a little bit higher in the sky. The tail of the big bear, Ursa Major, is the handle of the spoon of the Big Dipper. The body of Ursa Major, the big bear, is made up of these six stars, including the four stars of the spoon of the Big Dipper. The head of the bear kind of goes over to this star here. It's a bit pointy. And then its legs extend up into the sky during this season. It's kind of upside down this time of year. Let's see if we can, there we go. So there is our big bear, Ursa Major. Ursa Minor, the little bear, its stars are a bit dimmer, um, but you can kind of imagine a similar shape almost. There are a lot of different stories about these bears from different cultures throughout history. Even thousands of years in the past, there is recorded evidence of people seeing these patterns as pretty much the same bears. I like to think of it as sort of a poetic testament to the shared human experience that we see the stars in similar ways no matter where we are. Now, the little bear is most famous because it has a very important star at the end of its tail. I mentioned the star already. Its name is Polaris. Polaris is also nicknamed the North Star. Now, the North Star is special, um, not for a reason you might think. A lot of people think that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, but that's actually a common misconception. In fact, the North Star is just the 45th brightest star, so it's not even anywhere close. But in reality, the North Star is special because, well, it does something kind of interesting throughout the night. If we look at the North Star again, and I fast forward time, you might notice that the stars do not stay in the same place. They'll actually be spinning around our night sky. However, the North Star is special because it is the only star that doesn't move. No matter where you are on planet Earth, and no matter what time of night it is, if you can find that North Star, you can always find North, because a North Star always points North. All right, let's see if we can get ourselves back to our star tour time. Woo, oh, a little bit too far. <laughs> Still getting the feeling for these controls. I'm used to big planetarium, and uh, with this is a bit different, but it'll be a fun adventure for all of us, I think. All right, so that was the Big and Little Dipper. There's another pair of constellations over in the north that I always like to point out. The first one looks sort of like a little zigzag in the sky, a little W shape. This constellation's name is Cassiopeia. Next to Cassiopeia, we've got a little house-shaped constellation. This one's called Cepheus. 
So again, there are oops, there we go. There are these constellation patterns. Now they kind of look like uh, sort of boxes and squiggly lines in the sky. I'm pretty sure ancient people had much better imaginations than we do today, because the patterns they saw were very different. They saw these complicated patterns. Not really sure where they got that from, but there you go. So. According to mythology, Cepheus and Cassiopeia were the king and queen of an ancient African nation. Now, the queen Cassiopeia was very beautiful, but she was also very vain. She liked to brag about her beauty. In fact, in this picture, you can see she's looking in a mirror. Now, one day, Cassiopeia boasted that she was more beautiful than the daughters of Poseidon, the god of the sea. When Poseidon heard about this, he was not very happy, as you can imagine. A mere mortal claiming she was more beautiful than his immortal daughters, he could not let that stand, so as punishment, he cursed their land with years and years of flooding, washing away many of their crops and sending their kingdom into a terrible famine. Cepheus and Cassiopeia tried desperately to appease the god Poseidon and ease his wrath. They eventually did what any two good parents would have done in the situation, and they decided to sacrifice their own daughter to the sea god. Her daughter Andromeda is a constellation in the night sky near her loving parents. She is setting this season, so it's going to be hard to spot her, but she kind of looks like sort of an upside-down banana peel, I think. So there is her constellation. Now, luckily for Andromeda, a famous Greek hero named Perseus happened to be passing by that day on his winged horse Pegasus, and he noticed Andromeda was in trouble and decided to save the day. It just so happens that Perseus had recently defeated Medusa, and since he was still carrying Medusa's head around with him, he used it to turn the sea monster to stone, and he rescued the princess. And of course, as most of these stories go, Perseus and Andromeda fell in love, got married, and lived happily ever after. Hooray. <laughs> now, Andromeda is famous for another reason. It shares its name with a pretty interesting deep space object. Now, most deep space objects are so far away and so faint that you need powerful telescopes to see them, but there are a few deep space objects that are visible to the naked eye. And it just so happens that there is one near Andromeda that you can see. You get very far away from the city lights. We can see it here in our virtual planetarium. If you look closely, you might just be able to see a faint patch of light here. A little hazy smudge in our northwest sky. But as I zoom in, the power of our virtual planetarium will reveal that this is, in fact, the Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy is a giant, spiraling, swirling collection of billions of stars. This is how our universe is organized in these big star neighborhoods called galaxies. Our star neighborhood is named the Milky Way. Andromeda is kind of like the Milky Way's big sister. She's twice as big as the Milky Way, containing over one trillion stars. Also, she's kind of close to us. In fact, if she were brighter, she would occupy a space six times as wide as the moon in the evening sky. Pretty crazy, right? Now, the coolest thing about Andromeda, I think, is that it's on the move. It's traveling towards the Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, in about four billion years, our two galaxies will collide. Now, luckily for us, stars are so far away from one another that they really won't affect each other's solar systems. So if humans are around by then, it really won't matter to us. But it will be quite a light show to see in the sky of two galaxies merging together and eventually forming a brand new super galaxy. return to our evening sky, Kansas City skyline here. And we're going to continue onwards. Uh, let's just continue on here towards the west. Let's see what's going on here. Well, you can see our moon tonight. Oh. <laughs> let's uh, turn that off. We can see our moon shining uh, low in our western sky. Tonight's moon is a, a waxing crescent moon. Waxing means that it's currently getting bigger and brighter. A crescent means that there's just a sliver of a moon visible. Over the next few nights, the moon will continue to get brighter. And once it's half full, that's what we call its first quarter phase. It's a little confusing because it's half full. And why is it called a quarter? Well, that's because it's one quarter of the way through its cycle. Uh, so uh, that's what that means. And then after the first quarter, it'll be more than half full. That's what we call a gibbous moon. And then, of course, the full moon where it's uh, fully bright. And then after that, it's waning and it will start to get... Uh, dimmer and it'll also start to rise later in the evening. So this is a great time of the month uh, to look at the moon because it will be up in our early evening sky. In fact, you might even see it right around sunset. Now, facing towards the west tonight, the first thing you're probably going to notice besides that moon is this bright point of light right here. 
Now you might think that this is just another really bright star. There's something different about it. You look closely at it and you, and you compare it to stars nearby. You notice a difference between these two objects. Can you see these stars twinkling? Well, if you look closely, you can see that they're twinkling here in our virtual planetarium, just like they do in the real night sky. Now, uh, before this uh, live stream, uh, one of our friends, uh, Charlie, commented and uh, uh, pointed out that he really likes when the stars shine and twinkle. And so I wanted to shout out Charlie. Thanks for pointing that out. And that brings up a great topic about why stars twinkle. Um, the reason stars twinkle is because they're very, very far away from Earth. It takes a long time for a distant star's light to reach our planet. By the time a star's light does reach the Earth, only a tiny amount of, his, amount of it is able to pass through the Earth's dense atmosphere, and our atmosphere causes that little speck of light to become distorted, making it kind of wobble and twinkle. That's why stars twinkle. Now, this object over here, you might notice, is not twinkling. This object is much closer than distant stars, so a lot more of its light is reflected back towards Earth and appears as a wider disk of light, so it's not disrupted by our atmosphere, and it does not twinkle. This is a planet. And the planet you can see setting in the west tonight is Venus. <laughs> Let's see if we can zoom in on Venus here. Now, Venus is an interesting planet. Its nickname is Earth's sister planet. And it's moving pretty quickly. Let's pause time here. Venus is nicknamed Earth's sister planet because it shares many similarities with Earth. It's about the same size as Earth. It has a solid, rocky surface like Earth, and it has a dense atmosphere like Earth. It has clouds and weather patterns. Venus even has rain. That's about where the similarities stop because Venus's clouds are much thicker than Earth's. This has caused a runaway greenhouse effect that has heated the surface of Venus to over 900 degrees Fahrenheit, making it the hottest planet in our solar system, even though it's not the closest to the sun. This is the cloudy uh, outside of Venus, but if we could look through its clouds using radar imagery, which satellites can and do and have done, we would be able to see that its surface is a barren wasteland and it's covered in intense volcanic activity. It also rains sulfuric acid, so it's not a very pleasant place I'd like to visit. Now, Venus is interesting because it appears in phases, since Venus is closer uh, to the Sun than the Earth is. So we can see it in these phases. Uh, right now, Venus is kind of in its first quarter phase. It's kind of cool. A lot of people don't realize that. And in fact, if you have a good pair of binoculars, uh, you'd be able to see a Venus uh, and its uh, sort of phase there. You can see if it's a crescent or gibbous or full. Let's return back to our evening sky here. I did want to mention, uh, sort of while we're facing in this direction, I mentioned the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy. You can actually see the Milky Way stretching up in the sky right here. It's going to be pretty faint, and you might not be able to spot it on your computer screen, but um, that's mostly because uh, winter and spring are not a great time to look at the Milky Way. Um, during those seasons, we are kind of facing away from the galactic center, so uh, it's a lot dimmer. Summertime is a really good time uh, to look at um, the Milky Way. Uh, because we're facing towards the galactic center. Uh, I also wanted to shout out, we had a question from one of our audience members, Phil, who asked um, if uh, we would continue to be a spiral galaxy after this collision. And that's a very good question, Phil. Um, probably not. Uh, now, uh, there are a couple main reasons for that. First of all, when our two galaxies collide, their structures will be disrupted by that collision. Um, and uh, there will be a lot of uh, you know stars being flung in different directions. Um, and I, we know, or we're, we're pretty sure about that, uh, because we've also seen other galaxies uh, that are in the process of colliding or have already collided, um, other galaxies out in our universe. And so astronomers can look at those other examples of galaxies and measure their masses and uh, kind of compare them to our own, and we can kind of get a picture of what would happen. What would likely happen when our galaxies collide is that uh, they would form what's called an elliptical galaxy, which it doesn't have a nice spiral structure. It's just sort of like more of a blob. There are a lot of elliptical galaxies out there. Well, that's a great question, Phil. Thanks for asking that. All right, so we're gonna continue on. Uh, I also know I said this tour was gonna be about 20 minutes long, so um, thanks everyone for sticking around, and um, I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible, but also you're welcome to stick, along, stick around as long as you want, uh, and um, we can even try to grab a couple questions afterwards, but there are just a couple other highlights that I wanted to point out in our springtime skies, some of my favorite things. 
Um, for example, there's a constellation here uh, called Taurus the Bull. You can find its uh, the bull's head is this bright V pattern. Let's see if we can bring that up there. There we go. Uh, this bull uh, represents a couple different characters from a few different mythological traditions. Uh, the Greeks saw this bull as representing Zeus, the king of their gods. Um, Zeus used the bull disguise to kidnap a young princess um, who he swam across the ocean with her on his back. That's why they say we only see half of the bull constellation because his other half is submerged in water. But really, I wanted to point out Taurus because there's a cool deep space object that you can see with the naked eye on Taurus's back called the Pleiades Cluster, or Seven Sisters. Now, most people can see six to seven stars here with the naked eye. In reality, though, this cluster contains about 2,000 stars. They're all bound together by gravity. These stars are also siblings. They're all born together from the same nebula. You can see the leftovers of that nebula reflecting the light of these young stars. Star clusters like this are actually really useful tools to astronomers because they help us to understand the evolution and lifespans of stars. But I really like the Pleiades because it is a deep space object you can see with the naked eye. It's kind of fun to point out to your friends. The highlight of our winter and spring skies, in my personal opinion, is this very famous constellation here. It is, in fact, the brightest constellation in all the night sky if you combine its stars, and some of you might already recognize its pattern. It's Orion the Hunter. Orion's famous belt here, outlined by these four stars, are most recognizable. Orion is often shown holding a club or a sword and a shield or a bow in the other hand. Now, Orion uh, was a famous hunter from Greek mythology. Like Cassiopeia, though, he liked to brag about himself and uh, one day he bragged that he was such a good hunter he could capture every animal on earth if he wanted to. And Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, heard this boast. This made her very upset, so she punished Orion by sending a giant scorpion down from Mount Olympus to battle him and teach him a lesson. The scorpion and the hunter's fight is immortalized in our night sky as the constellations Orion and Scorpius chase each other through the seasons. Scorpius is a summer constellation. Now, Venus is the brightest point of light in the night sky tonight. Um, and we'll be able to see it uh, for a while, uh, probably a few more months. The cool thing about Venus is that um, you can always see it either in the early morning or early evening sky. That's why it's nicknamed the morning star or the evening star. Not a star, of course, but that's when you can see it because it is close to the sun. Um, so you can pretty much always see Venus any time of year. You just uh, either need to set your alarm early or late. Um, so that was a question that uh, came in from Justin. I just wanted to shout that out. But while I was talking about Venus, like I said, it's the brightest point of light. But if you're wondering what the brightest star is tonight, it's going to be this one over here. This is the star Sirius. Sirius is actually the brightest star in the night sky, uh, no matter where you are on Earth. Um, if you draw an imaginary line through Orion's belt here, it points right at Sirius. So that's an easy way to find it. Sirius is nicknamed the Dog Star. It's part of a dog constellation named Canis Major. This was one of Orion's hunting dogs. You can fast forward a little bit so you can see it. Oop, I think it's hiding behind uh, the Liberty Memorial. We'll adjust that for next time. Um, this is where the term Dog Days of Summer comes from, by the way, because in the summertime you can see Sirius rising in the early morning sky. Um, also, if there are any Harry Potter fans in the audience, it might make a little more sense to you now why one of the characters in that story is named Sirius. Dog star. Right. Now, Orion plays host to a very famous deep space object. It's my personal favorite deep space object, so I think this might be the last official stop on our local star tour. Um, I do want to just go over to the east in just a second to show you some other things rising. And I will stick around for questions because we're getting a lot of them coming in. Thanks so much for participating, guys. Um, I'm very excited to answer those. But while we're finishing up our tour, I'm just going to zoom in right below Orion's belt here. You see a smaller group of three dimmer stars. This is, uh, some people say, is Orion's dagger or uh, sword hilt. Really, though, this is hiding another deep space object that you can't really see with the naked eye, um, but you can see with a pretty basic telescope. I'll talk about telescopes a little bit later as well. This is the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula uh, makes uh, for a great uh, desktop background. <laughs> it's a beautiful collection of brightly colored, hot and dense gas and dust. Um, but really the coolest thing about it is that it's a stellar nursery. It's a birthplace of stars. 
So deep inside this nebula, gas and dust is getting pulled together by the force of gravity. Over millions of years, this forms gigantic spheres of gas. And as these balls of gas grow in size, their gravity increases, which compresses their core. And as this compression uh, accelerates, their core becomes hotter and hotter. Eventually, these balls of gas reach a point where they contain enough energy to ignite stellar fusion, and they become stars. This is how all stars are born. This is how our sun was born. This gas and dust is often left over from uh, supernovas, stars that died and exploded and spread their elements back out into space. Now, occasionally, these balls of gas don't get big enough to turn into stars, and they'll become gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Sometimes there's some rocky debris left over from those supernova explosions uh, that will form solid planets like Earth. So, just to recap all of this, our sun uh, was formed by an ancient star that died billions of years ago. And everything that our sun is made out of came from that star. In turn, everything that the Earth is made out of was created by a supernova. And everything that you are made out of, every element in the human body was actually forged in the core of an ancient star that died billions of years ago. So. In a very real and scientific sense, they're all made of stardust. I like ending my star tours on that little sentiment, because it's nice to think about. A lot of people feel small when they look up at the night sky, but thinking about that makes me feel big, because it makes me feel connected to the universe and very tangible. All right, so that is the bulk of what I wanted to show off. I did want to point out uh, just one other constellation real quick that's fun to spot. There's a cool asterism you can use to find it that looks sort of like a backwards question mark or a coat hanger hook. This is Leo the Lion. And it's going to be rising in the east in the early evening tonight. So look for that coat hanger hook and you'll find Leo. But as we circle back around to northern sky, to our Union Station skyline, this does bring us to the end of our little virtual star tour uh, for today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to, to uh, see who all joined us. Uh, I wasn't really, be able, wasn't really able to look directly at at the, the chat, but I hope you guys are, are enjoying this, and I hope um, uh, hope you're uh, having good conversations about the night sky, I guess. Um, I did get a couple questions, though, so stick around, and uh, I will try to answer those while we're here. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, Bradley asked a question, do stars ever disappear? That's actually a great question. Uh, that is relevant to something we looked at. I'm going to go back to Orion here. Now, one of the stars in Orion is named Betelgeuse. It's this one right here. A Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. In fact, if we zoom in on it, or what it would look like. Oh, it's just like a fuzzy blob. <laughs> I wasn't sure what it was going to look like. Um, but uh, Betelgeuse, uh, like I said, is a red supergiant. Now, a red supergiant is a star that is very massive and is reaching the end of its life. Now, when supermassive stars, supergiants, reach the very end of their lifetime, they will explode into a supernova. Now, supernovas have been recorded throughout history, and they are actually so bright that you can often see them in the daytime sky, um, which is pretty crazy. Now, Betelgeuse, uh, you might have heard in the news recently, it's been getting a bit dimmer over the past few months. Um, it had actually stopped getting dimmer and has started to get brighter again, but a lot of scientists were thinking that maybe Betelgeuse was approaching its supernova phase. Now, upon further inspection, we actually saw that Betelgeuse um, was dimmer mostly because its form was sort of changing shapes. Supergiant stars aren't really uh, sort of like round objects. They're more of like blobby clouds. Um, so the sh blobby cloud shape of, of Betelgeuse sort of was changing, and that's why it was dimmer. But um, it's crazy to think that Betelgeuse could disappear within our lifetimes, and there are a lot of stars that, that could change and are constantly changing. So... Um, so Bradley, hope that answers your question about if stars ever disappear. Uh, they do, and it's uh, reasonable to expect some of the bright stars might actually disappear uh, within recorded human history, maybe even our lifetimes. Let's see. Brian asked a great question. If I had to name a star, what would I name it? Uh, that's an awesome question, Brian. I appreciate you tuning in. Um, uh, that's a really good question. A lot of star names come from uh, either Greek or or Roman uh, mythology. There are a bunch of stars that are also um, uh, Arabic in, in, in name. Uh, their names come from that. Uh, some stars and uh, space objects, um, we've even reached into uh, different mythologies like uh, Inuit mythology and uh, Native American and Aboriginal mythology. Um, if I had to personally name a star though, this is a question I've never thought of, but um, uh, I feel like, uh, hmm, I'm going to have to ponder this and maybe get back to you, Brian. 
Um, I feel like it would be really cool to name a star after a figure of uh, mythology um, that's really not represented. So uh, maybe something uh, Aboriginal or Native American. That's probably what I would choose. But I'd have to do a little more research and maybe consult with some experts in that field. Um, all right, Eric is asking if we can see the International Space Station. We actually can, uh, and I believe this simulates where it would be visible. I think, well, the International Space Station is interesting. It orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes, um, and it's also pretty bright. Uh, it has a high albedo, which uh, means it is very reflective. But the trick is it has to be in the right position uh, for us to see it. So sometimes it's so bright and reflecting light right back at you that you can see it, um, you know, when the sun is even still out, uh, but other times it's so faint you can't even see it um, in the nighttime. Uh, but we can try out, and in fact I turn satellites on and we can see some dots flying around. Um, these are some brighter satellites that are recorded. Uh, but as far as the International Space Station goes, we might just have to see if we get lucky. Um, so if we just fast forward time, the International Space Station will be very bright. You know what, I could cheat also because there's a search function. <laughs> um, international... Oop. Yeah. Uh, maybe it is. Let's see. Oh, no, no, not what I wanted. <laughs> well, again, we're figuring out the software here. Um, let's see if I can get that out again. Ah, here we go. Um, all right. Whoop. Okay, looks like it's below the ground right now. Um, but let's see. All right, we're at about midnight. Okay, so it looks like the International Space Station will be up after midnight tonight um, but according to this simulation it's not very bright so let's see if we fast forward enough Whoop! and there it goes out of sight it looks like tonight you might not be able to spot it but there are um, a lot of times you can spot it uh, and uh, there's actually a, some great resources in fact if I um, just do a quick search for um, International Space Station uh, visibility um, there are websites you can type in your coordinates uh, and your uh, time, and it'll tell you when you'd be likely be able to see the International Space Station. So thanks for that question, Eric. Uh, going on to Alex. Alex is asking um, if we can see any blue or red giant stars in the sky. So I did mention uh, that Betelgeuse is a red giant star. Um, but that's a, a good thing to bring up because you might have noticed stars are all different colors. Uh, and what does a red star mean? What does a blue star mean? Well, the color of a star and the wavelengths of light that it emits actually uh, reveals its uh, surface temperature as well as its composition. We can look at distant stars and we can read the light they're emitting to figure out what they're made of. Um, and we can read their surface light to figure out their surface temperature. And we can combine that data with their brightness to learn a lot about the star's age and where it is in its uh, evolutionary life cycle. So yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, blue and red stars. In fact, oh, let's get back to we're spinning our star tour. Um, the star opposite to Betelgeuse down here is named Rigel, um, and Rigel is a blue star. It's much younger and much hotter than uh, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a red giant star. Red means its surface is a lot cooler. Alex is asking about the constellation Draco. Draco is visible near um, our dippers here. In fact, it's kind of snaking between the dippers. Uh, there it is. Now, Draco is sort of a fainter constellation to spot. Um, but again, you can kind of see it slithering right between the spoons here. So that is the constellation Draco, Alex. Let's see, uh, Jeanette is asking what a shooting star is. That's a great question, Jeanette. Oop, let's turn these constellations off. Uh, shooting stars are not really stars. Uh, that's a bit of a misnomer, and they you appear in the night sky, uh, so they seem like stars. But what they actually are are um, particles of debris in space that are entering the Earth's atmosphere. Um, a lot of these particles are very, very small, the size of a grain of rice. But as they enter the atmosphere very, very quickly, um, the uh, air pressure comp uh, pushing up against them causes a lot of friction and heat, and occasionally they'll ignite and uh, they'll appear as shooting stars. Um, a lot of these are harmless, uh, and we also call them meteor showers. Meteor showers are uh, actually predictable and regular. As the Earth orbits the sun, it passes through known clouds of debris, and that's why we have uh, annual meteor showers. You may have heard of the Perseid meteor shower, um, or the Leonid meteor shower. Um, and a quick trick for finding those meteor showers is that they're named after the constellations that they appear to emit from. So the Perseid meteor shower will be appearing to come from the constellation Perseus. All right, so uh, Jessica is asking, 
How many people are on the International Space Station? That's a good question. Um, and there's kind of a fun website for this, I believe. Uh, there's a, it's how many people are in space right now dot com. <laughs> how do you like that? Um, so if you go to how many people are in space right now dot com, that'll show you. Uh, oh, and the answer is three, by the way. And it's uh, Andrew Morgan, who's an American flight engineer. He's been in space for 251 days. Wow. Uh, Oleg uh, Skripo um, Skripochka, hope I got that right. He's a Russian flight engineer. He's been in space 184 days. And Jessica Mir, who's a flight engineer uh, from the US, who's been in space for 184 days. A lot of time hanging out in space. All right. So that about uh, brings us to the end of today's uh, Star Tour. Thanks so much for sticking around and asking some amazing questions. Um, as we get a handle on how this whole live streaming thing works, uh, we'll try to make these even more interactive. Uh, but I appreciate your patience uh, working with us as we test out these new new ways we can bring our science to you all. Um, thank you all so much again from uh, everywhere you are watching. I hear we had some people um, in a lot of different places, so thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this uh, little tour of the night sky and be sure to stick around and check out uh, Union Station Kansas City's Facebook page for uh, future live streams from the planetarium and from other uh, parts of our science center and organization. And we hope to be bringing you even more science live while we're all at home. Um, stay safe, everyone. And uh, thanks again and happy stargazing. <laughs>